So I'm Stan Love. I'm a NASA astronaut. I was hired in the class of 1998. In 2008, I flew on space mission STS-122 on the shuttle Atlantis. And our mission was to deliver the European Space Agency's Columbus Laboratory module to the space station. Uh, that was a two week flight. I was a robot arm operator and I did two spacewalks. Uh, our crew attached that laboratory and then came on back to Earth. Uh, for day jobs in the office when I wasn't preparing or flying in space, I have been working mostly on future missions. And at the time that meant Orion and Artemis and the moon program. And now those missions are happening. So I've been designing the cockpit displays and controls, switches, hand controllers, electronic readouts uh, for the Orion spacecraft. And then I'm also gonna be the lead Capcom for Artemis II. So in about a year and a half's time, when we send a crew of four on a 10 day mission around the moon, if you watch that mission on TV, the person in mission control, wearing the dress shirt and tie, talking to those guys in space will be me. So flying in space, of course, that's, that's what it's all for. And that is the most amazing experience. And in particular, uh, the second spacewalk, uh, first one was very difficult for me. The second one was better planned. I knew what I had to do better. Um, and at the end of that, we, uh, our orbit was taking us right over the west coast of the United States where I grew up. It was February, uh, normally in Oregon in February. It's similar to here in, in Britain in February, cloudy, but that day it was clear from Mexico to Canada and just seeing the whole world that I'd known uh, growing up rolling underneath me while I'm sitting outside in a spacesuit and looking at it through a spacesuit helmet. That was just an amazing moment. To me, the thing was as, as an astronomer and always looking out away from the earth into, and seeing beautiful and amazing things out in space, the ability to look back and, and learn for the first time that the most interesting thing in space is the earth. It's colorful, it's changeable. It, it has all the life and the clouds moving and the, you can see the ocean currents in the sun glint. Um, just so many amazing things going on. And then the next orbit, it's all, it's all new and different. Um, no place else in the solar system or out in the universe is like that. And of course, life is the most amazing thing that goes on here. Um, so to me, the revelation was that, that space has a lot of interesting things in it, but the most interesting is the Earth. So I have been involved with the development of the vehicles we'll use for Artemis since about 2004, so 20 years this year. Um, I was also involved with the development of the rocket that will carry the Orion capsule into space. For the missions themselves, Artemis 1, that one's in the bag. We did that in late 2022. Uh, we flew an Orion capsule with no people and no life support system out to the moon, uh, uh, slingshotted it up into a high orbit around the moon for about a week, and then came back with a low flyby of the moon and then back to Earth. So for 26 days, we tested out every system on that spacecraft, except the life support system, so there's no crew. Uh, and I have seen a lot of test flights over my careers, but I've never before seen one where the flight directors and controllers were beating on the doors in, in Johnson Space Center, looking for more things to test on that spacecraft because everything they tested on it was working beautifully. Most times test flights are not that smooth. So it was the best test flight I've ever seen and they came up with 10 or 12 more things to test on it before they brought it back. Artemis II, this time we're putting people on board. That'll launch in about a year and a half. Uh, it'll have a crew of four. Uh, we're sending them on a flight around the moon. We're not gonna try to land on the moon on this one. And this time we're gonna test out the life support system. So first flight of that system, we'll have people on board and we're taking a very gradual approach to getting away from Earth. First, we'll start real close. We'll make sure things kind of work and then we'll get a little further away and make sure everything else is working. And then if we're good and ready, we'll go send them around the moon. So that'll be a 10 day flight. We'll bring them back, uh, land them. And then hopefully about a year later, we will fly the, a crew of four out to a high lunar orbit where they will meet a lander launched separately by one of our private space companies. Uh, two of them will climb into that ladder, fly, a lander, fly down to the surface of the moon, spend a few days doing some spacewalks, testing out the suits, uh, doing a little bit of geology, and then they'll do the whole thing in reverse, climb back into the lander, fly back up to Orion, Everybody gets in Orion and goes home, and I think the lander is supposed to come back to low Earth orbit, refuel, so that it can be used again. My job as the Capcom is I am the voice of the mission control team to the crew in space. 
So uh, if the flight controllers need the crew to do something, they will talk to the flight director who's really in charge. By the way, it's the flight director that's in charge of the mission, not the commander up in the spaceship. The flight director down here really runs the show. Um, flight director decides what we'll do and then whatever information needs to get to the crew, they'll tell the Capcom. Capcom is the person with their finger on the radio and they transmit the message up to, up to space. So your job is to get the right words to the crew. Um, and a part of that, which you sort of learn later, is it's not just that you have to use exactly the right words, the right terminology, make your call at the correct time, use as few syllables as possible. Um, if it can have no errors in it, if you tell them to type the wrong numbers in the computer for an engine burn and they burn wrong, that could be the end of them, right? You may, may not be able to get home. So it all has to be perfect and right. Uh, but then when you take your thumb off of that transmit button, the main message the crew needs to get is we love you. <laughs> because as soon as they get the feeling that the ground is not connected to them anymore, that, that breaks the team and, and we can't function together very well. So the um, secret job of Capcom is you are the crew's advocate in the control center. Um, traditionally, they have only let astronauts, other astronauts, be Capcoms because they supposedly have that good link with their friends up in orbit. These days, we're, we're beating down that barrier and allowing anyone who has the skill set uh, to do that job. Still takes a lot of training. Um, but the idea is if the crew is overworked and tired and it's been a long day, we're, we're working them past the, the time when they should be able to knock off and get ready for bed and the Capcom detects that in their voices, Capcom can kind of lean over to the flight director and say, hey, uh, they're sounding kind of tired. Can we knock some activities off of today and, and put them on to tomorrow? So that's sort of the secret job. And then the super secret job is uh, if you are an old Capcom, such as myself, uh, and have sufficiently earned the trust of the flight director, you may be the only other person in the room besides the flight director who's over age 30 and sometimes the flight director will lean on the Capcom to help them make decisions using the experience, you know, the, the, the Capcom's experience if they have more experience than some of the other flight controllers. And that has to really be earned and you don't offer that help, but you maybe ask that help if you're doing a good job. So it's an amazing job, of course, with a degree in astronomy, nothing in my education prepared me to do that job and there is no reason I ought to like it, but I really do like it. I was at Capcom for many years for the space shuttle and the space station, and very much looking forward to reprising that role for the Artemis missions. So we don't like high tech in space, and everyone's jaw just dropped when they heard that statement. We hate high tech. We don't want the new thing, because the new thing might not work in a radiation environment, and if it you know, coughs up and gives you the blue screen of death, it may literally be the blue screen of death. So we want things that are proven to work. So the Orion screens are not touch screens. So that would be like 2020s technology. We're sort of 1980s technology. We have a screen with edge keys, but the keys don't have a specific function. Depending on what you've pulled up on that display, the edge keys will have different labels. And then the key does what the label next to it says. So it's sort of 1980s fighter plane kind of technology rather than, than touchscreen. But it beats the heck out of the space shuttle. Uh, the space shuttle had about 1,000 switches and circuit breakers in the cockpit that the crew could use. And there was a time when I knew what all of them were. And I was the flight engineer, in you know, trained to be flight engineer for the space shuttle. Um, Orion has about 50 switches all the other functions are put onto the electronic screens. So you'll either use an edge key or you'll use a little rotary knob to select an item, hit enter, and then it gives you the command options for that. So the technology has advanced quite a little bit, uh, but depending on who the supplier is, it can be more or less, but the trend is toward more software controls, more automation, and less hardware controls, less uh, human operator having to make all of the decisions. Uh, I wasn't sure. I thought space was really cool. So I knew I was going to do something that had to do with space and science. Um, I didn't find out that astronaut was like a job you could apply for and get until I was in college. And by that time I was working on a degree in physics. I had a pilot's license and it seemed like it might be a possibility. 
So I kept working in the field of space and engineering and aviation. And while I was doing that, I applied to be an astronaut. I applied seven times. I got interviewed three times, and then finally they hired me. Four years of university, not sure what I wanted for a career. I was accepted into a graduate program in astronomy. I wasn't sure that was what I wanted to do until the summer after university and before grad school, I was looking for work and ended up in the corn cannery and a few weeks in the cannery and I'm, yeah, send me back to school. <laughs> I don't wanna be in the cannery. Um, so six years pursuing a PhD in astronomy at the University of Washington. By then it was clear that people with PhDs in astronomy were not getting jobs. The system was set up so a professor would train 10 or 12 graduate students over their career and then retire and leave one job opening. So it was clear that I was going to have to change careers a lot. I took aerospace engineering courses as electives to give myself some flexibility. Um, after my PhD, I had a short postdoctoral appointment at the University of Hawaii. Well, that didn't suck. Um, and another one at Caltech and then another spacecraft engineering course I took down there, turned into a job interview up the road at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I became an engineer up there and was having the time of my life. And then my seven years of astronaut applications came through and then I found a better job. And I've been at NASA ever since. And every day it's a different job, lots and lots of variety, always a new skill to master which on the plus side, there's always something interesting new to learn. On the minus side, every day I found out something that I could probably have done better. Uh, <laughs> so always a learning experience. Um, and then of course I'm getting ready to uh, be that Capcom for Artemis too, which will be very exciting. Uh, over my whole career, well, of course the spacewalk on my space flight, that was, that was the biggie. Um, I've been twice to Antarctica to search for meteorites. Both of those trips were amazing. If you can't get to space, go to Antarctica. It's the nearest thing to it on Earth. And it also has the advantage that ordinary people can go to Antarctica. And it's very hard to get hired as an astronaut. There are lots of opportunities to, to go south and, and see the southern continent. Um, I've gotten to drive submarines in lakes and in the sea as a stand-in for a miniature spacecraft if we were exploring an asteroid. When I was a graduate student, uh, I took a road trip to Alaska that was kind of fun. Um, had a chance to climb Mount Rainier. Um, learning to fly a plane was pretty amazing. Uh, I've been to some amazing launches. Uh, I sat in mission control the day the Russians deorbited their old Mir station. And so we got to be there live for that. Um, I was a huge Star Trek fan growing up. Uh, one day I was sitting Capcom in mission control and Michelle Nichols, the actress who played Lieutenant Uhura in the original series, came by for a visit. I got to shake hands with uh, one of my heroes from uh, early science fiction and uh, tell her that everybody sitting in this room, all the other flight controllers, they're here because of you. Your show set the example for a positive future. And actually so much science fiction these days is kind of, doesn't make you look forward to the future, which is a pity because we're kind of committed to going there. But science fiction that shows a positive future makes people excited about uh, careers in science and technology, and maybe becoming a flight controller or an astronaut in mission control. So first of all, getting human beings back on the moon and getting a wider range of human beings on the moon since uh, everybody else who's been there was a old white male test pilot. <laughs> so our next time we put people on the moon, there's gonna be a woman and a person of color um, we haven't decided who yet, so don't ask me. I don't know. Uh, and the Artemis program is specifically international. So it's not just NASA going and everybody else can watch and either cheer if you're on our, our side or grumble if you're on a different side. Um, the Artemis Accords, which is a set of agreements for sort of how to behave in space and reducing orbital debris and aiding each other when you're in an emergency and that sort of thing has now been signed by over 20 countries, uh, including the UK. So it's going to be an international uh, endeavor. Artemis II, our first piloted flight of an Orion capsule is carrying a Canadian around the moon. Any career you can think of on Earth, there is a space version of that. Um, the folks who put together our meals 
our food for space, you know, space cooks. <laughs> and oh, by the way, what you make has to be shelf stable without refrigeration for a year and still taste good. And that's a challenge. So all, all walks of life exist in space. Math and science. And if you don't like them, do them anyway. <laughs> and by the way, if you have a solid grounding in math and science, even if your career doesn't take you to space, it will take you somewhere that is uh, interesting and probably pays a good living as well. That's the best advice I would give. Math and science are lead to good careers. Your country and your world need you because math and science teaches you quantitative skills, um, how to tell uh, truth from falsehood. And every year we get more falsehood flooding into our brains from various sources and being able to tell what's real and what's not is possibly the most valuable skill you can have. And you don't necessarily get that training in other fields. If you have any background in engineering, there's a place in space for you. Uh, we, we do need space historians, but we only need a few of them. <laughs> uh, but there's, there are good careers if you have an engineering background, and that means uh, you know elect electrical, signals, mechanical. We're always trying to figure out new and better ways to build spacecraft so that they can do their jobs. And spacecraft work in a challenging environment. You're very limited in, in, in to how heavy things can be, how much power they can use. Um, they work in an environment with high radiation, which makes electronics hard. So there's an endless supply of difficult problems that we need clever engineers to solve.